this is the third and final installment of the series of talks from complex to non Archimedean geometry and back. And enter non Archimedean geometry and then emerge a complex setting, I presume. So, then go ahead. Thank you, Ron. Uh, okay, so we continue our journey to, towards some version of the, the YTD conjecture. So the, the goal today is to explain uh, a result by obtained by Chile not so long ago, maybe already two years ago, maybe time is flying. Uh, okay, and so that, that's based on a non-Archimedean analog of pluripotential theory on Berkovich spaces that we developed uh, together with uh, Charles Favre and Matthias Jonsson, and that provides an interpretation of the algebra geometric condition of case stability. So let me uh, <clears throat> try to convince you that it's natural to view things uh, in this way, starting from where we ended before, which is the, that we have this uh, criterion to decide whether the, there exists a CSCK matrix in terms of the growth of the K energy functional. And for that, we know that it's enough to look at what happens along a geodesic ray in the space E1. So we still have our compact Keter manifold X, whose complex dimension is N, and V is the volume of the corresponding Keter class. That's for notation. Uh, <clears throat> so we have seen this notion of PSH, a PSH path, um, which it's a family of omega PSH functions, uh, the singular version of the Keller potential that depends also on the T parameter in the PSH way. So it's a PSH function in all variables together. And for that, we, we had before we had complexified the T variable by adding some imaginary parts. But for what we want to do here, we want to study the, the behavior at infinity of the ray. It's more convenient and, and it fits more with the algebra geometric picture to take another conformal model, which is a punctured disk. So we want to view a ray as a, a certain omega PSH function, capital phi, on the product of X with the punctured disk, and it's uh, S1 invariant, okay? And we will be interested in its behavior near the origin of the disk. So at the moment, there's no reason that it could be quite wide actually near the, near the X times zero, if we don't make any assumption. So we, we are going to assume that the, the, the growth is at most linear as T goes to infinity. And this is something reasonable because it will be automatic for PSH geodesic rays in E1. You can show that the geodesic condition uh, enables to, to show that the soup grows at most uh, like big O of T. Uh, <clears throat> so if we do that, then we can somehow assume that A is equal to zero, we just shift by the harmonic function log of, so tau here is the complex variable in, in the disk, and, and we shift, we translate phi by adding A times log tau, we get a new PSH function phi tilde, and, and this one is bounded above. Now we've got a bounded above PSH function uh, away from a closed sub-variety, analytic sub-variety, and PSH functions extends across such things uh, almost for free, just take some lean soup of the values and, and you get some unique extension of uh, phi tilde to an omega PSH function on, on X times the times the, the whole disk. And of course it's, it's still a S1 invariant. <clears throat> so we, we, now we want to look at the singularities of this function. So, uh, S, which S, sorry. PSA. Ah, ah, yeah, sorry. So P is for plurry, S is for sub, and H is for harmonic. Yeah. So in, in terms of thinking about the previous variable T, is, is it related to, is when T goes to infinity, we're actually approaching the origin? Exactly, yeah, exactly, so yeah. That's the, yeah the, sort of the key absolutely, yeah. I mean, t, the, the change of variable is that t is equal to minus log tau. So when t goes to plus infinity, tau goes to zero, and we are interested in the singularities. So on the, on the boundary of the disk, it's, it's the initial value of the ray, 
and we want to understand what happens when we approach the, the center of the disk. And so even if uh, phi here, if the ray consists of smooth functions, so capital phi is then uh, finite valued away from the center of the disk, but if you extend it in a PSH way like that, it will you typically become singular. If you take the value minus infinity along the, the central fiber x times zero, and there are ways to measure singularities of PSH functions in terms of low numbers. We'll come back to that later. But here we make some assumption. We look at the simplest kind of singularities it could possibly acquire, which are called uh, analytic singularities. So that means that the singularities are described in terms of an holomorphic functions. So precisely, you assume that phi tilde up to some multiplicative factor, one over m, is given by the log of a sum of moduli of holomorphic functions plus some bounded term that doesn't matter and we assume the singularities really only occur um, x times zero so the the ideal generated by those functions uh, is trivial away from the central fiber that's the assumption of analytic singularities and in general case we have uh, ways to approximate more general psh functions by functions that have this type of singularities thanks to the work of the may but we I will come back to that later. So this is the kind of algebraic geometric um, rays we are looking at here, the ones that have this behavior at infinity. Uh, so now the, the choice of the functions fi here is not quite canonical. The ideal is not, uh, could depend on what you are looking at locally, but there's a way to recover a globally defined ideal shift. If you assume the singularities are, are like that, then you look at the ideal shift on x times uh, d of holomorphic functions uh, that are bounded above. I mean, the log of that is bounded above by m p tilde, this, is, this m here, plus o of 1. So you look at all functions f that could be candidates in the description of the, of the analytic singular, singularities, the fi's we had before. And this ideal shift turns out to be coherent. So that's coherence of integral closures of. Uh, coherent ideal shifts, which is a result in analytic geometry. And it's still, uh, it's S1 invariant because F P tilde is S1 invariant. So then such an ideal shift is actually uh, of a very nice shape automatically. We will call that following Odaka, we'll call that a flag ideal. I mean, I'm not sure if you want to introduce this terminology, but the idea is that such an ideal actually is just given by a flag of ideals on X and increasing finite sequence of ideals on x uh, that you multiply by powers of tau. Okay, so I, A is automatically of this form and actually, and therefore extends globally. You, you can think of it as an ideal on x times P1, which is C star invariant. And it's split into this eigen components AI. <clears throat> um, now you can blow up x times P1 along this ideal to turn it into a divisor because it's easier to analyze the singularities that we have if, if there is only one function f instead of the whole collection of fi's you blow up like that and that's exactly what you get is is known as a test configuration and i guess this terminology goes back to simon Donaldson. so it's you can think of it as a c star equivalent compactification of x times p1 minus the origin you add the fiber over zero and it's gonna be denoted by X zero. <clears throat> and because it's a blow up, actually we, you could take anything above the blow up. So A has become a divisor, E, it's an effective divisor. And, uh, and then uh, as far as the singularities of phi are concerned, they are exactly encoded now in the, in the Q divisor D here, which is one, or minus one over m because we had this one over n factor before uh, times e, but we, we have also shifted by a times log tau before. So if you come back to phi itself and not phi tilde, we also add uh, a times x zero. So anyway, we have some q divisor uh, that really tells you exactly how the singularities of the ray at infinity look like. And uh, as a matter of terminology, we will say that such a, a divisor is a vertical divisor because it, its support is on the central fiber x0. And the notation for that is div0 of x, the divisors that, that are supported on this 
central fiber. So every uh, <coughs> ray with analytic singularities gives rise to a certain vertical divisor on a certain test configuration. Now we, we want to view uh, this data as uh, defining a kind of analog of uh, a Keller potential on, on the space of valuations. And that could be the Berkovich space. So one way to describe that is uh, as follows. It's a kind of spectrum in the sense of what you would do for sister algebras and the Gelfand spectrum, but uh, non archimedean version of that. So you, you look at the set I of all flag ideals we had before. And if you look at the set of ideals, you, you can take the sum of ideals and the products. So it's a semi ring and you can look at characters but in the tropical sense. So what I mean here is that you look at functions defined on the set I with non-negative values, and they have this valuation-like uh, properties. The V on the product is the sum of the Vs, and V on the sum is the mean of the Vs. And you normalize them by the value on tau, which plays a special role in this set I. Uh, you normalize that to be one. And then, um, and then it's, well, you can endow this set with simply the topology of pointwise convergence. And it's easy to see that you get a compact Hausdorff uh, space just by Tikhonov's uh, theorem, because V of tau is equal to one. So now the value on any A will be bounded because A has to contain some power of tau because it's, A is trivial away from the central fiber. And so you get a bound for any given A. And it means that X, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that the, the notation here is bet. So the, the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that's for Berkovich, obviously. It's not my invention to <laughs> introduce this notation. But anyway, so X bet here is the, this compact Hausdorff space of valuation like functions. So these ideals are yeah. vertically supported? Exactly, yeah, yeah. These flag ideals, they are trivial away from the central fiber X0. So they, they do contain some positive power of tau. And therefore, X, X bet here uh, is closed subset because we are looking at closed conditions in the product of compact intervals. So it's compact by Tikhonov. And it's always quite cheap to get compactness if, when you use pointwise convergence as a topology. And uh, okay, so here X is just a, a Keller manifold. So that's why you cannot really say that it's, you, are, you, you have to take this roundabout way to, to define this analytification. But if you assume that X is projective and therefore algebraic, then, then it's an algebraic variety over the field C that you view as endowed with the trivial absolute value as that we've seen before. And then you can apply the analytification functor of Berkovich. That, that's for any variety over any uh, valued field. And that defines for you uh, a certain space that turns out to be equal to this space we are defining here as a topological space. And what is this Berkovich identification? It's just a natural compactification of the space of valuations on the function field. But that's not something you can use in the Keller situation because the function field is typically be trivial, you can have a, only constant neomorphic functions. So you won't, don't want to argue on a global level like that. You, you use uh, ideal sheaves instead. Uh, okay, so we have this space. I missed that. Something's trivial and yet you still aren't doing it. Sorry? I, did, I missed what you just uh, said. No, no, what I'm saying is that you cannot use this description here uh, if X is not projective. If you don't assume that X is, uh, is projective, then you, you might uh, be looking at a two-dimensional compact complex torus for which the, the field of meromorphic function is just the constants. So valuations on that field are not very interesting. But if you use ideal sheaves instead, as we did, then you have more information and you still have a, the right space in any case. Um, okay, and in fact, we are mostly interested in the values of so the way you would pass from evaluation on X to, ev to evaluation on the product with P1, which is what you need to make sense of V of A, is by, is by something known as Gauss extension. But, but anyway, I mean, 
here it's better to just I mean, you, you can directly evaluate the, the functions v on, on ideals a because that's what we need. Okay, so now there's a natural space of functions, uh, on, of continuous functions on the Berkovich space, because each ideal defines uh, by the evaluation map a function on x bet, which is continuous by definition. So you just look at all functions you get like that. And if you take div, that's going to be almost a vector space, except you can only take sums. And if you include differences as well, and you also you allow to divide by an, an integer, you get a Q vector space. Could you actually work through an example in some detail, say for a complex torus? Absolutely, yeah. That that's you will see an example in a, in a, in the second. Uh, I mean, you will see a picture. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Are you done? Uh, yes. Well, I wonder what you mean by piecewise linear functions on. Yeah. Something. So that, that's a it's a definition. So uh, okay. So let me give at least one reason why we want to call them like that. So it's just a definition. We look at this space of of uh, functions that correspond to ideals and the corresponding vector space, and we want to call it PL. But if you restrict to the toric situation, they, they really correspond to PL functions on R to the N. So that's the main reason, probably. But there is also a description. OK, let, let, let me just show you a picture in a minute and I will say a bit more. So let's take that just as a, as a terminology that we can argue about. But the, the space you get is at any rate stable under max and mean basically from the definitions, and it separates points. So this space of PL functions here, uh, just for those reasons, and because it's a cubic space by the right version of, of stone strass it's going to be dense in C0 of x bet. So it, it will play the role of smooth functions that we were using in the usual uh, complex setting. It's the, the, the test functions that we want to use. Okay, and now the picture. Uh, so if you assume the dimension is one, then X is projective. So we can use the description as a space of valuations on the function field of X. It's a compact it's a projective curve. And then uh, there are not so many valuations in dimension one like that. It's just basically vanishing order at some point of X, some point P and multiples of these. Uh, you also have the trivial valuation, which is always equal to zero. That's the center of this uh, graph here. And you can also take t, let t go to infinity, and you get something which is not quite a valuation, but a, a semi valuation. That, that's the way you compactify the space of the set of valuations on the function field itself is not compact, but you compactify it by adding those endpoints. And so it's, it's a, it's a star like, star shaped. Uh, real tree that you, you have with infinitely many branches. And the way that uh, this thing is compact is uh, the reason it's compact anyway, it's because it's, it's endowed with a weak topology for which every neighborhood of the, the central, central point uh, contains almost all branches. Okay, in fact, every R tree has a weak topology like that, that makes it compact. And uh, so that, that's the space that we've got. And if you look at the PL functions before, here they, they are really exactly functions that are constant on almost all branches and are piecewise in R on each branch on which they are not constant. So that's one justification for the terminology. But in, in, in fact, for each P on the curve, you have a ray. So yeah, of, of course, I'm not able to draw uncountably many branches, but, but you should imagine that it's, uh, Kind of wild uh, thing happening at, in the center. Uh, yeah, but I mean, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in fact, strangely enough, the information we've got, if you just look at the space itself, uh, they all look the same for all curves, which is a bit silly, right? I mean, so it, because. It, it's just parameterized by points on X. And for any, whatever the genus is or the geometry is, X has the cardinality uh, of the reals. And so you have uncountably many 
points like that, and that, that's it. So, so, so it's, it's, it's not meant to reflect the geometry of X. It's just each point of X defines a valuation. You can scale it so you get a branch, and you have one branch for each point. And so it, it looks like a, a star shaped. Uh, say it again. So the topology, the weak topology for which, uh, so if you're away from the central point, it's just the usual topology on the branch. But each neighborhood of the central point contains almost all branches, all but finitely many branches. So they are huge. Yeah, that's the way you get compactness, right? Uh, okay. No, because it's Hausdorff. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, 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 yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's like a weak topology in a Hilbert space or. <clears throat> and uh, okay, and the PL functions are really PL here. And I should just say that this picture admits uh, a generalization in higher dimensions, where the Berkovich space can be described as the projective limits of simply short complexes, more and more ramified. And the PL functions really correspond to PL functions on the on the on the face on the simplices. So that's the picture. Uh, and now we are going to mimic the definitions we, we saw and we know in the, the complex situation to export them or throw some kind of analogy uh, in this non archimedian space that we just saw. So we first want to define uh, mont jean measures, to attach mont jean measures to the PL functions that we, we've just defined. So we pick some test configuration. So the first thing we are going to do is to reinterpret uh, the PL functions as corresponding to vertical divisors on test configurations, because that's what we are interested in. That's what encodes the singularities of the rays that we saw before. So you pick one test configuration and you write the, the, the irreducible decomposition of its central fiber like that, the sum of BF, some multiplicities BF times uh, the irreducible components F. And each F like that defines for you a uh, valuation on that's that's a true valuation on the test configuration, but vanishing order along f, and that you can evaluate uh, uh, on in on the ideal on on a given flag ideal a, and well you you normalize in this way b, you divide by b f so that the value on tau is equal to one as we imposed before, and and then you are defining one point in this Berkovich space x bet. So we define, we denote that, that by VF. So uh, central, the irreducible components of the central fiber of a, every test configuration gives rise to a finite number of, of points in X bet. And now if you change the test configuration, you take all of them, you will get a certain subset of X bet, which is the set of divisorial valuations, and it's a dense subset. And if you are working in the projective situation, which you can assume if you prefer in order to clarify the picture, we are looking at really at valuations on the function field of X. And these are the usual the divisorial valuations attached to a prime divisor on some birational model of X. So you can realize here you start from a divisor on X0 and you can re. Uh, realize this valuation as vanishing order along a prime divisor on some blow up of X. This relies on playing around with the, the invariance of valuations and characterization of divisorial valuations in terms of rational rank and etc. cetera. Uh, okay. So now <clears throat> every test configuration also uh, defines well, if you take a test configuration and a, vert a vertical divisor on it, on it so an element in the space div zero, this divisor supported on, on x zero, it will define some PL function on x bet. So d is taken to phi d. And uh, what you do here is that you, what you uh, re require is that if your divisor d comes from an ideal a by blowing up this ideal, then you want the corresponding function to be the function defined by the ideal. Okay, so if you blow up A, you get the divisor D, and then you want that phi D is the corresponding function. 
And since any divisor on X can be written as a difference of say relatively ample divisors, they will come from ideals and you will be describing the map. Uh, you will get this linear map. Uh, that's the that's the ideal uh, sheaf of D. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just what happens in algebraic geometry. But uh, you, you, for any divisor, you can define O of D as a fractional ideal uh, or line bundle if you prefer. It's locally locally free sheaf. And uh, anyway, yeah. So, so D is effective if you do that. Okay, and 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 what uh, you get out of that is that so for each test configuration you you get PL functions. Those maps are compatible by pulling back, and what you get is a description of the space of PL functions as the projective limit of the space of uh, vertical divisors. So if you ever heard of, about B divisors in the sense of Shokurov that are of common use in rational geometry. That's a B divisor description of PL functions. So PL functions, they correspond by definition to ideals, but they also correspond to divisors by blowing up. And the precise correspondence is via this isomorphism here. Okay, now we do, so that's again some discutable terminology, but it's just to make the analogy with the complex case uh, uh, more vivid. So you, def you introduce a space of what we want to call closed PP forms on XBET as uh, a similar projective uh, injective limit of uh, spaces of PP classes on, on test configurations. Why not? Uh, now we can use the intersection pairing. So if you take an element, in Z and N, it's it's uh, it's represented by some N N class on some test configuration. So that's 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 a class of uh, dimen B dimension one one, and you can pair it with a divisor on on X. So you get a, a pairing between P L functions and N N forms like that. And if you dualize, it means that you can take some N N form to uh, a measure on X bet. Because a measure is a linear function on the space of continuous functions, but uh, that contains PL functions as a dense subset. So basically, to define a measure on XBET, it's enough to define it on PL functions, which are the test functions. So this way, you can attach, the uh, attach a measure to Z and N. So you will see a more con concrete uh, description of that anyway in, in a minute. It's just to, to present things in a way that resembles the complex case. So now you, you start with some PL function. And you attach to it a closed one one form omega phi with brackets. Bracket omega is the class of omega. And uh, this one one form is represented by some one one class on some test configuration, which is by definition the class omega x. So you, you pull back omega to the test configuration and you add to it the class of the divisor that represents phi. And now you can take the nth power of that. So you get some closed n n form. You divide by the volume. And that defines a measure. And that's the non Archimedean Montjampère measure, ma bet of phi. But in fact, it's, it's a quite simple measure. It's, in the end of the day, what you get is just the finite sum of Dirac masses. So if the function corresponds to the divisor d, you just get the finite sum of Dirac masses at the, the valuations VF corresponding to the finitely many irreducible components of X0, and the coefficients are computed in terms of intersection numbers. So it's just some gadget that encodes intersection numbers like that. Yes. Sorry, I'm just getting a bit like lost because there's a lot of things going sure. on. Sure. Yeah. So you have X, you start with something like X cross disk, and you have an ideal sort of sheaf be away from absolutely yeah. origin and then you yeah. have to resolve somehow so yeah. it becomes yeah. an actual chief on some blow up or something but it's it becomes a divisor yeah, yeah it's become mm. a divisor mm. thing or close to divisor 
thing. And then uh -huh. you're going to get PP forms on that thing and taking some limits. You sort of blow up more and more. Uh, yes. Is, is that, that's how it, that's what it's supposed to look like. Just want to make sure that's one of the things. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we start with an we start with an ideal shift that is trivial away from the away from the origin, so you can view it as an ideal shift on x times p one. You blow up to turn it into a divisor, and then you play with intersection numbers associated to that. You just have omega, you have d, and you 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 look at the degree of that on on the various uh, irreducible components of the central fiber. And you encode this information into this gadget here that we call the non archimedean Morampère measure. But I mean, so far we just have this collection of numbers. But, but, but how, 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 how far? I mean, uh, yeah, it can work with some more. I mean, all of this is on a model. On, on a what, sorry? No, no. It's on the model, yeah. It's on the I mean, test. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. So so far, of course, it's just it can definitely wonder why you would want to use this language that gives everybody a headache <laughs> if it's just. So no, I, mean, I mean, no, I mean, the so, the, the point is to, it's to take limits. So you, we want to to use uh, this notation that is reminiscent of what happens in, in the complex case because we are also going to introduce e one etc. After afterwards. Take, take limits of those more ampere measures. So there won't be those simple minded measures uh, that, that have only um, a finite support anymore. So they will become more interesting. But the point of all that is that we want to compute the slopes at infinity of the various functionals we had before, and especially the K energy functional. We have a ray, has singularity, so it defines some D like that. How do you compute the slope at infinity of the K energy? And, and the answer should be. It's the non Archimedean K energy evaluated on. Well, so you'll see. But you've been assuming in this slide that you're looking at a projective manifold. I mean, no. Case, uh, sorry, but no. I, I see. So this, this would work even if you say have no normal functions at all. Yeah. Yeah, I've designed the definitions so that they work also in the non projective case. Yeah. But but and there's no modification here of any of any of this discussion that you have. Yeah. Yeah, what's written about yeah in the beginning is that it coincides with the usual definition of exit projective, but if it's not, well it's another definition that still makes sense. So the question is this formula for this point of measure, this uh -huh. is like you're trying to sort of copy what you did in the complex case. Oh, no. Well, I mean, I've presented things in a way that make it look like uh, the complex case, but uh, there are no, yeah, it's quite different. But it's just, I mean, it's just something that does exist. That, uh, there's a group of people who do that on the coverage spaces. It's been going on for some time. It comes from Arakelov geometry initially. So, I mean, it's not out of the blue like that, but. Um, but it's not, it's not really, if you look at this formula here, I would not say that it's, it's with intersection numbers. It's difficult to argue that it's exactly the same as taking IDD bar of uh, smooth functions to the smooth function to the n. It's, a, it's quite a bit different on the face of it. But if you specialize to the toric situation, then you can argue in the end of the day that there is a common ground for the two. So these test configurations, they're like a, you walk, you take like some kind of flag device and you walk the central fiber. Yes. Oh, uh, so yeah, I mean, test configurations, you can also think of them as projective uh, barational morphisms, equivalent ones uh, over x times p1. And then the other is domination. So you have two such barational models. Uh, well, there's a natural uh, barational map between the two. And if it's a morphism, then you say that one dominates the other. And by the graph, you can find a third one that dominates two. So it's an inductive set and you can take limits. Okay, now we will define uh, the non archimedean analog, uh, analog of the functionals we saw in the Keller case. And 
this define case stability in a way that is reminiscent of coercivity of the k-energy functional. So first of all, we, we've seen this non accumulated mont pair operator just before. And just as in the complex case, it, it admits a primitive. There's a functional on PL functions, such that when you uh, compute directional derivatives, you are integrating against the mont pair measure. So that we call the non accumulated mont pair energy. And in fact, it's something quite simple because of the simple nature of the mont pair measure before. So if you realize phi as phi d for some vertical divisor d, in fact, this energy here is just the top self-intersection of the, the class omega plus d, normalized in some way. So it's basically just a, a top degree self, top self-intersection computed on this projective variety, well, compact color script x. Uh, then, as we did yesterday with uh, in the complex case, you can also differentiate with respect to omega now. You introduce this nabla uh, theta of e as a derivative in the direction of theta. <clears throat> so, given the nature of it's just the polynomial, it's just omega plus d to the n plus one, so that you can certainly differentiate. But remember, you should pay attention to the fact that v also depends on omega. So you, different, you differentiate the quotient. And of course, you can write down the formula that I won't write. Uh, so now for the entropy part, that's something that for the moment we just accept. And a theorem is going, going to justify that. So that, that relies on the log discrepancy function in, in virtual geometry. So the log discrepancy function here can be defined on divisor evaluations in this way. So that's because we are looking at divisor evaluations that are not really evaluations on X because of the killer nature of the situation. But if X is projective, it's just the usual like discrepancy function from MMP. So anyways, just take for granted that you can define some like discrepancy function in this setting. And then the odd, thing here is that the, the entropy is defined in this way. So in the complex case, we, we were integrating a mont pair measure of phi. Uh, we are integrating the log of the density of the mont pair of phi against the mont pair of phi. And here we integrate the log discrepancy function. So th that's a phenomenon which is a bit strange and that creates problem I will come back to later on, but we just accept that this is something at least it's, it's a non-negative functional on. Uh, okay, and then the non accumulated Mabuchi K energy, we take the same formula that we had before but with bet everywhere. So it's H plus Nabla in the direction of minus Ricci of E. And the class of minus Ricci is the class of the canonical bundle Kx. So we are differentiating in the direction of Kx. Okay, now we want to impose some positivity to, to our PL functions, just like we have for Keller potentials. So we look at PL functions, such that omega plus D is ample on, well, not ample, but Keller on X zero, so positive on X zero in the sense of cohomology classes. Uh, and that corresponds to M, to the test configurations. If everything is projective and omega is really the class of a, of a line bundle, this is, these, this is the usual notion of test configurations, including a line bundle with ampleness built in. Uh, and uh, okay, and then this M bet here, if you evaluate it for some phi non Archimedean Keller potential, which is basically a test configuration, then you are in fact computing the Donaldson Futaki invariant of the test configuration up to some minor error term that you can get rid of by some base change. So that comes from some uh, expression of this invariant in terms of intersection numbers. We are just rep repackaging all that, but it's things that go back to the work of Wang and Odaka. And then we can formulate case stability, or more precisely uniform case stability, as a kind of coercivity condition for the this non-Archimedean K energy. So you want it to be positive, but 
more precisely, uh, greater than some positive multiple of uh, something you can think of as a kind of norm or distance function on on the space of non archimedean scalar potentials. So that, that really corresponds to the usual notion of uniform case stability. It's just presented in a slightly different way. And now the reason for all that is justified by what comes here. So you want to look at slopes of functionals. You want to say that all these bet versions of functionals really compute slopes at infinity. Uh, so you, you pick one of these rays we've been considering with analytic singularities. And uh, we've seen that this uh, produces some vertical divisor on the test configuration that encodes the singularities at infinity of the ray. And this, in turn, defines some PL function that I will denote by phi infinity. So it's the data at infinity of the ray, like we saw before for rays of norms. So we have some non-Archimedean object attached at infinity to some ray of Archimedean objects as in the case of spaces of norms. Uh, and then the theorem here that really goes back to the work of Pong, Ross, and Sturm, and then myself is Isamoto Janssen, and in the Keller case, uh, Zacharias, Sjöström, Dierefeld. Uh, so you, you pick one of these Keller potentials, basically a test configuration, but including a line bundle or a class. And then the following holes. So first of all, you can represent this uh, non archimedean Kader potential in a unique way by some ray with analytic singularities. So there's a unique uh, PSH geodesic ray with analytic singularities that has as an initial value uh, zero, but well, you could take some other initial value if you want, actually, it doesn't really matter. And the value at infinity is the given function phi. So the data, it's Again, a kind of boundary value problem. Somehow there's a unique representative like that to prescribe what happens at both ends. And uh, now if you look at the various functionals that we've seen, so the Mont-Jean-Pierre energy, one of these NABLA versions of it, H, which is the entropy, and then M, which is the K energy, the Mabuchi K energy. Then for each of these, uh, the, the slope at infinity along the ray is computed by the non archimedean version, the bed version of the functional. So that's the main justification, of course, for the previous definitions, in particular for the entropy. It justifies the use of the log discrepancy function we have we've seen before. I'm sorry? How should you understand this? So we, we've seen before that. Uh, those limits are important because uh, coercivity of M is encoded in order, in order for M to be coercive, you, you should look at the slopes at infinity along all rays. And if it's positive always, then it's coercive. So that, that's the main motivation to look at the slope at infinity like that. But another, uh, well, more concrete illustration of that, if you want, is the following direct uh, consequence. So if you assume that X omega is uniquely CSCK, as a unique CSCK metric in the, in the cohomology class of omega, then it has to be uniformly K-stable. So that's one implication in the YTD correspondence uh, conjecture, and uh, you would like to get the, the converse implication. Uh, and the proof of that at this point is quite... I'm sorry? I did, yeah. But I can show it again if you want. It's the, the last thing here. The, so, so K stability means that this non Archimedean K energy is coercive. It means that the non Archimedean Mabuchi K energy, M bet, is co well, it is, satisfies this inequality here on non Archimedean K law potentials. But that you can think of as coercivity of this functional. Is the, the very last one, oh. the very last one, yeah. It's, it's some algebra geometric condition that uh, if, if it's the first time you see it, I mean, I guess it's just some, some condition with intersection numbers that doesn't look particularly appealing like that, but 
it's, it's supposed to tell you when you can find a CSCK metric. <clears throat> okay, so let me come back to my proof. Uh, so you assume that uh, you have this unique CSCK condition. And we saw yesterday that uh, this implies, and in fact is equivalent to the coercivity of, of the K energy functional M, the real one, I mean, the, the one on E1, on the complex side of the story. So we have an inequality like that. And then what you do is that you pick uh, phi T as in the theorem. So you pick one of these non-Archimedean Keller potentials, you realize it as a, as a ray phi T, and you plug in phi T in the, the coercivity inequality for M. And, and now you divide by T, you let T go to infinity, and you get exactly, then it kills the constant C, and you get exactly the uniform case stability condition. So you see what this is telling you is that uniform case stability is exactly the coercivity of the Mabuchi functional on, on, the, on the ray, on, on the set of rays that have analytic singularities. It's a, the algebra geometric rays. And, and you would like to propagate that to all rays. So in order to, to do that, we, we first want to enlarge this set of uh, algebra geometric rays by taking limits on the algebra geometric side of the story. So we move on to non-Archimedean potentials of finite energy. And to do that, we mimic the definitions that we saw in the complex case again. So we know what non-Archimedean Keller potentials are. And we declare that uh, omega PSH functions on the Berkovich space are decreasing, limit, decreasing limits of uh, non Archimedean Keller potentials. So that description is valid in the complex case. It's a theorem. Sure. So if, suppose you're in a, in a case where the, your, your theta class is, is not rational, maybe there are very few square work of your variety. Do you expect that there are a lot of non-trivial sets of configurations? Uh, yes, I guess, yeah. So, it's, I mean, there's, so the usual way of constructing yeah. would be taking a little bit of projected space, you can't do that. No, but I mean, the point is that uh, test configurations correspond to Barishman model of X times P1. So you add this extra P1 direction, and, and then you can just blow up, you blow, you blow up a point in X times zero, and you keep going, you, then, then you have a projective, projective space appearing. You blow up a, a curve in it, and then, I mean, you have many things to blow up, and they will give rise to test configuration. So you have, you have many, many sub varieties around because you have this extra factor P1. So even though X itself has, has a very poor geometry, very few sub varieties, X times P1 does. So you use a, a piece of terminology that uh, talks about the algebra geometric rays. Those are the ones presumably that come from the kind of test configurations you've been talking about before. But more yes, exactly. I mean, yeah, I've, I've used the terminology um, analytic singularities, but I still think of that as algebraic geometry in the analytic category if you want yeah. so that's what i call them algebra geometric rays but yeah strictly speaking in the Keller cases it's not really algebraic geometry anymore <clears throat> uh, okay so omega psh functions are decreasing limits of Keller potentials by definition uh, it turns out that there is a natural topology which is a kind of analog of the l1 topology or PSH functions. So such functions happen to be always finite valued on divisorial valuations, and you put the topology of pointwise convergence. Or well, anyway, it's not very important, but there's natural topology on PSH functions. Then we, we had before this non-Archimedean Montjamper energy, and as its uh, complex counterpart, it's non-decreasing on Keller potentials because the derivative is the Montjamper measure, which is a positive measure. Or Keller potentials. So you can uh, again extend it by monotonicity, just like we did yesterday. So you, you take some PSH function phi, you write it as the decreasing limit of Keller potentials phi i, and you declare that E of phi is the decreasing limit of the E of phi i's. And again, you define E1, but the bet version, non-Archimedean potentials of finite energy, 
as those omega pch functions for which the energy is finite and again that's justified well there's a strong topology just as yesterday you refine the topology to make e continuous and the justification for that is that uh, the the pair operator extends by continuity to e1 as in the complex case and also those various energy functionals so e and it's there well e by definition is continuous on e1 but also the gradient versions are continuous so to some extent we get a nice analog of the complex situation that's non-archimedean pluripotential we're doing here uh, and so the, the we want to define the k energy on this space uh, e1 bet so we need the entropy part as well so for that the, the mont -Jean we know that the mont -Jean measure makes sense for any phi in e1 and we want to integrate the log discrepancy function against that but the log discrepancy function is defined only on divisorial valuations so you extend it to the space of all valuations or more specifically to this Berkovich space by taking the maximal LSC extension and, and it coincides with various extensions of uh, log discrepancy functions that were constructed before like we did in the work with a uh, Fabre and the Fernex a while ago for example uh, okay so you have the non archimedean entropy and you can define the non archimedean k energy only one by the same formula as before so the entropy part is integrate the log discrepancy function and again m is h plus the nabla of e in the direction of kx and that extends the, the functional from killer potentials to uh, all uh, things in e1 uh, okay so now uh, these non-archimedean potentials of finite energy they will again uh, be associated to certain rays not with analytic singularities anymore but still related to algebraic geometry somehow uh, so if you take any PSH ray of linear growth as in the the beginning then in fact it will define one of these omega PSH functions so in the beginning we, we are really looking only at rays with analytic singular singularity so the corresponding function was a PL function attached to a divisor here there is no divisor anymore but you can still define a function like that and that's where uh, Lulon numbers are uh, playing a role. So the Lulon numbers are invariants that uh, measure the singularities of PSH functions, and that they are kind of analog for them of the va vanishing order along a divisor for holomorphic function. I'm not going to tell you too much about that, but so you have these invariants, and um, they define for you a function on X div that extends uniquely to an omega PSH function uh, on the Berkowitz space and this is proved by using the maze uh, results that allow you to approximate any PSH ray like that by PSH rays with analytic singularities and this way you will be able to write phi infinity here here as a decreasing limit of uh, killer potentials non-archimedian killer potentials um okay so it, now if if the ray rather lies in e1 if it's a psh geodes geodesic ray in e1 then the corresponding function phi infinity also lies in e1 it's a non-archimedian potential of finite energy but uh now troubles arise because uh it's you don't have anymore the fact that the slope at infinity of the the energy is computed by its non-archimedian counterpart you just have an inequality and equality can fail so the good rays are the one for which the ones for which equality holds then we call them maximal rays so the maximal rays are the ones that are nicely behaved from this point of view uh, and they are again uniquely determined by the the boundary data the initial point phi zero in e1 and the phi infinity in the non-archimedian e1 and conversely, if you take uh, some phi zero and some phi infinity, there is a unique maximal ray that connects them. So the, that's a, a theorem, but I mean, it's 
through, hopefully. And so you get you get a realization of the non-Archimedean potentials of finite energy as uh, as the set of maximal geodesic rays in in E1. So E1 hat is the set of all geodesic rays, and there's a subset in there of maximal ones that is in one-to-one -one correspondence with non-Archimedean potentials of finite energy. Uh, so it's it's really a, it's a closed subset for the metric on E1. So that's not completely trivial, but E1 bet here is also complete for some non-Archimedean version of the D1 metric we saw yesterday. And uh, the isomorphism above is actually an isometry for the metrics. So it's closed, uh, but it's a strict subset always. So already in the one dimensional case, you can construct some example, well, maybe I should not go into that too much, but you can basically we have functions that have a non-trivial behavior, PSH functions that have a non-trivial behavior from the potential theory point of view, but still have identically zero low numbers. And they give rise to rays which are non-trivial, but for which the non-Archimedean data is trivial because the singularities are too small somehow. So that's basically it goes back to work of, of Darvash. And uh, okay, now we want to say that if, if you want to look at the slopes of functionals on uh, those uh, maximal rays that correspond to some non Archimedean data, uh, then um, as far as the energy part is concerned, you, you do compute the slope at infinity by evaluating on the non Archimedean counterpart. So here a bet is missing on the right. And for the entropy, you have at least an inequality. So that, that's basically, well, that's something that Chile proves in his paper. In part, it relies on, on work we did before with Berman uh, and, and Jonsson. <clears throat> okay, so now we can come to the, the main point is in Chile's paper. Um, so what Chile, now the situation is that um, you, you have, uh, yeah, maybe I should show this again. Yeah. So the inequality here in, in two goes in the right direction in the sense that you, you want to know, you make some assumption on the, the bet side, on the non-Archimedean side. So you, you, would, you, you will know something about H bet from below. That, that that is going to follow from some assumption of uh, case stability type. And the inequality here goes in the right direction. It will tell you that the slope of the, the true entropy is at least as large uh, as the one on the non archimedean side. So you will get information about the growth of the K energy. But so now you worry about the rays that uh, are not maximal because these you don't see, you don't have any information about them. And so the main point in Chile's uh, paper is to show that these rays don't matter. Because if, if you look at, you take the entropy along some PSA ge geodesic ray, uh, if it grows very fast, faster than linear, then uh, you're good because you know that the growth will be, um, and the slope at infinity will be plus infinity. So certainly, that, that's the condition that you, you want to know. You want to know that the slope at infinity of the K energy is positive always. If it's plus infinity, well, it's certainly positive. Uh, and if not, then it means the entropy grows at most uh, linearly. And then it shows that in that case, the ray has to be maximal, has to, to come from algebraic geometry. And as a consequence of that, you get uh, a version of YTD in the other direction. So here you define say strong case stability, you, it's the same condition as before, but not only on test configurations, but also on limits of these, which are uh, embodied in this uh, E1 bet space, so potentials of finite energy, non archimedean ones. Then you have uniquely CSCK, and then you have uniform case stability that we saw before. And the assertion is that one implies two implies three. So strong case stability implies that you have a CSCK metric, unique one, well, it implies, in, in fact, it implies you have coercivity of the K energy, and therefore by Chen Cheng, you have a unique CSCK metric. And then two implies three that we saw before already. And then to complete the, the picture, you would need to show 
that three implies one. And that's the, this conjecture we made with Matthias Janssen, the entropy approximation conjecture. That if you take any function in E1 bet, you can regularize it, write it as the limit of non archimedean Keller potentials in such a way that the non archimedean entropy converges. So that, that means exactly that uh, the extension of the non archimedean K energy functional we have constructed before is the maximal. LSC extension. So that's something which, which is true on the complex side of the story. It was proved by Berman, Darvash, and Lou. And we hope that the same holds in the non archimedean case, that there, is, there are ser serious difficulties and it's still wide open at the moment. But so if, if you can prove this conjecture, then you're done. It will tell you that three implies one, and then you have equivalence of all that. Uh, so I was meaning to show you briefly a proof of the theorem, but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I should stop. Uh, actually, no. I mean, I, I don't know if I can go slightly over time or not. I can. Well, then I will do that to you. <laughs> uh, okay. I say it again. Sorry. Is there any way to to check your strongly statement? Yeah, I mean, there's a fairly long story about that. So, the, what we've proved with Matthias, so strong, the strong case stability is equivalent. And in Chile's papers, it, paper shows that already is equivalent to uniform case stability with respect to filtrations on the ring of sections if omega is a, a class of a line bundle, which is the main case of interest, probably. Uh, and there's also evaluative characterization of this condition in terms not of, of only one valuation, but a finite set of divisorial valuations. That's something we've done with Matthias. So, for example, we, we prove with this kind of techniques that it's an open condition with respect to omega, which we want to think as a kind of analog of uh, Lebrun Simonka's result that you can deform CSCK metrics if you have uh, no vector fields okay um well but then whether it's easy to test it or not i mean it's, it's it was a debate already for fano in the fano case i mean you need people to prove theorems <laughs> at the moment uh, it's not like it's i i give you a polarized manifold can you tell if it's case stable i mean but, i i can't but <laughs> is your expectation of if there's a failure case stability that you can always you, you could find some bad test configuration that would give it away. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you, you can come up with a fairly long wish list that there would be a maximally destabilizing object and so on and so forth. That's, it's mostly wide open as, as soon as you leave the world of uh, Fano varieties. You don't know anything. <clears throat> okay, so let me give you an idea of the, the proof of Chile's results. That's not it's kind of nice. Um, okay, so you, 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 take, you take a geodesic ray in E1, along which the entropy grows at most linearly. And you want to show uh, that this ray is, is, ma is maximal in the sense that it, it really, it's really the one that is determined by the non archimedean data. So this ray determines at any rate some non archimedean potential of finite energy to infinity. And you denote by psi t the, the maximal ray that corresponds to, to the same data, boundary data, phi zero, phi infinity. And the terminology of maximality is not completely for free. I mean, so they are really maximal in some sense. They correspond to some Perron envelope construction. So psi t here will, will be greater than the given ray phi t. And you have also uh, some information about the energy. Well, we know that the energy is linear anyway for geodesics. And what you need to show is that, uh, in fact, the energies are equal. You need to show that. Uh, so, so I denote the difference of the energies is a linear function that vanishes at zero, a times t. And you want to show that a is zero. So you, you, you look at the corresponding uh, PSH functions on X times the, the punctured disk. Uh, and the information you've got is that they have the same Lono numbers. That, that's what it means that they share the same non-Archimedean data. 
psi infinity equal phi infinity. That means th those functions have, have the same singularities as far as little numbers are concerned. And, and that gives you some uh, exponential integrability uh, property, thanks again to the maze work and multiplayer ideals and so on. If you have, under those circumstances, the exponential of psi minus phi is uh, in LP for any finite P. You get some integrability condition like that. And that you can rewrite in terms of the rays by some passing to polar, polar coordinates. So you have, you have uh, this integrability condition that is satisfied for any P. Now you play simply with a, there's a relation between this sort of uh, exponential integrals and the entropy, which is just given by Jensen's inequality. But I mean, in fact, the entropy of a measure is the Legendre transform of the log of the integral of exponential function. So you have by some log inequality, you have something like that. Uh, and now the, the first term here with the Montjampère, it's actually greater than the difference of the energies. Uh, so that's some inequality that turns out to be true in this context. It's a reflection of the concavity of E uh, with respect to the naive linear structure and PSH functions. Okay, then uh, you put everything together and you get that a certain integral here on the right has to be finite for all P but it's p times a. So if a is positive, it won't happen that this is always integrable, right? So, so a has to be zero and you're done. Okay, so, I, so you see, I mean, it, it's not a very hard thing once you have the machinery of uh, like the, say, the maze stuff on ideals and so on. Okay, so that, that's it, thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>